The next speaker um, is Dr. Bertrand Trion from uh, Université Paris-Saclay, uh, France, and in Rio. Uh, Dr. Thirion is a senior researcher in the MIND team at Inrio saclay uh, His research uh, activities focus on developing a statistical and machine learning techniques for brain imaging. Um, he contributes to both algorithms and software with a special focus on functional neuroimaging applications. He's involved in the Norisphine CEA Neuroimaging Center, one of the leading places in high field for uh, brain imaging. Uh, from 2018 to 2021, Dr. Thirion has been the head of um, the Data EA Institute uh, that federates research on AI, data science, and uh, their societal impact in Paris Saclay uh, University. In 2020, he has been appointed as a member of the expert committee in, the in charge of in charge of advising the government during the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2021, he has become the head of science of the Indrio Sackley uh, Research Center. Dr. Thirion is PI of the Carib AI chair and of the individual uh, brain charting project. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Please join me and welcome Dr. Thirion. So thank you for the invitation here uh, at this conference. It's really wonderful. The, the topics that are covered, it's just incredible. And, uh, and thank you also for the introduction. So in this talk, I will be giving um, a perspective, a uh, data science perspective on, uh, on brain mapping. So what can we do with data science to improve the analysis of uh, brain activity? Right. 10 years ago, maybe I will go to this, more to this uh, screen there, yeah, to this uh, board. So 10 years ago, uh, no imaging people realized that we were all doing it wrong, <laughs> that the conclusions that we were producing from our data sets were wrong because they were underpowered and that the results were not reliable. And it's um, uh, something that's been realized in many fields of life sciences in particular but particularly so in neuroscience and in, in brain imaging. And so people have started to react, gather uh, bigger data sets, but then uh, of course uh, the cost in the number of acquisition, the cost is N when you do neuroimaging. And so uh, to get more data, you also need to get other people's data. So people are, have, start, have started to share data, to make data publicly available. And, Certainly, this has improved a lot the standard of the communities and the, and the quality of research that can be done. So, for instance, the paper here refers to uh, uh, Open Neuro, which is one of these great community initiatives that make it possible to, to share data and then to reuse your colleagues' data. And this is great. But now we have new problems uh, when we want to uh, process data coming from different labs because. Each one has its own way to probe questions. And the, the way you ask a question will condition the kind of uh, results that you will produce, the kind of protocol you will use. And then, of course, it's very hard to piece together the, the different uh, information coming from data sets acquired from different perspectives. Um, I think we all know that intuitively, but uh, now we really face the, the question in practical terms. So how do we meta-analyze all these data? So here I will uh, present two perspectives, a rather simpler one based on uh, machine learning perspectives in which we integrate all data, just leveraging common representations, which is already good. But then we will go much further and try to really identify common concepts across studies that we would be able to identify. So first at an image level and then at a conceptual level. So more in detail, I will start with uh, looking at common representations across uh, data sets at the, um, at the image level. Then I will do this in the wild brain activity decoding, which is a more conceptual thing. And finally, I will discuss uh, uh, data sets labeling issues, which are core to this objective. Okay, so uh, we will start by learning good representations from, uh, for brain images taken from arbitrary different data sets, just you know, data provided by the community. 
Well, uh, you, we can start with unsupervised learning, you know, just try to take the heap of data and, and find structure in it. Uh, one sensible way to do that, for instance, is to use dictionary learning. Um, that is, will essentially decompose your heap of images written as, as a big matrix where you have stacked all the values of each, each image and try to factorize it into special loadings with some sparsity constraint because you want the regions to be well localized. And then some functional loadings are here written as time series, but think of it as, as, as just you know, functional loadings. So uh, here we're just leveraging the fact that people report, they, they put their data in MNI space, in a common space, so that we can essentially, uh, we have a, a common special representation for all data sets and so we can stack all data sets together in this big X matrix. The only issue is that this big X matrix weights now six terabytes. It doesn't fit in memory in most computers. So uh, you need to be to do some fancy thing like online learning and, and subsampling to make this work. But so we, we could make it. And this has given us this uh, uh, DFU mode for dictionary of functional modes at last. Here you, you just see kind of few components. So at the beginning, these are just overlapping components, uh, like the output of dictionary learnings. You can get as many as you want from 64 to 1024. And uh, it's, uh, it's pretty clean. I mean, there is no constraint in the problem. Just throwing uh, that many data will give you relatively a, a nice component that outline a, a recurrent structure in brain activity. And once you have that, well, it's a, it's a great plus because now uh, you can essentially uh, uh, encode an image by the functional loadings on these components. Like if you take, say, the 1024 uh, atlases, so you can just say, okay, I can rep represent an image by 1024 dimensional vector that represents the, the, um, the activity associated with each uh, special mode of the decomposition. So what we have done was to, uh, to take all the data that we could uh, use after some pre-processing, et cetera. So discussing with colleagues to get as many as, as possible. And uh, uh, so these data are just you know, brain images, which are the result of a classical uh, analysis pipeline uh, and together with labels. So for each data set, you know which uh, um, contrast was corresponding to, to the image. You also have a lot of uh, uh, unlabeled data, which are resting state uh, data. And then you can throw that in a, in a neural network uh, with a few layers, only three layers. It's not really a deep network. The first layer is just the unsupervised uh, part that I've just discussed. You can just you know, reduce your images from like 100,000 dimensions to like 1,000. It makes your life much, much easier. It, actually, it's... 500 on this slide, but conceptually, this is the same thing. And then you will have a, a bottleneck uh, layer of your, for your model. And finally, some uh, classification heads in which for each data set, you will try to identify the label associated with each image, okay? So for each sub data set that you had originally as input, uh, you have a multi-class classification problem and you just want to guess the labels. Just we, so we, we, we train the classifier here together with a bottleneck layer uh, together to optimize uh, classification accuracy. Okay, once you do that, so you, you start with your big, biggish images with 200,000 voxel values. You have reduced them to like 512 dimensions with an unsupervised atlas. And then with a the bottleneck layer, you have this intermediate representation of 128. Uh, networks that kind of summarize the, the information contained in images and that will be used to predict the, the labels. Okay, when you do that and you look at, at the uh, prediction accuracy of the model, you see interesting facts. So there are, I think, 35 data sets, if I remember correctly. Um, in gray, you would have the decoding accuracy when you take the data set alone and just decode as you would do uh, on the standard machine learning uh, standard machine learning tools. And in black, what you get by using this uh, neural network that takes all studies together. 
And on the right, you have the difference in accuracy. So you see that the, the uh, multi-study decoder actually does much better in average. You, you gain a five, six percent in accuracy in average across studies, and you gain in about 80 percent of the studies. In a few of them, you lose a little bit of accuracy. So this is great. Um, we can look at the accuracy gain as a function of the baseline accuracy before fitting the multi-study model while well, there is not much information. I think the big information is that when you look at the accuracy gain with respect to the number of, of samples in your study, okay? So when you have few samples in your study, you gain quite a lot, maybe seven, eight percent in average. Uh, and this reduces when you take as input uh, bigger studies, okay? So this hints at something like a, a transfer inform of information where uh, big studies, big data sets, have provided some informations captured in common representations that help decoding uh, small studies. Um, and last message from this slide is, uh, oh, just doing the dimension reduction did not help much, okay? So here this was just based on the unsupervised uh, uh, reduction. There was no gain in accuracy with respect to the baseline. The gain in accuracy came from computing this uh, uh, task specialized network with a, from the supervision of the system. We can also uh, do some uh, learning curves to see how the thing behaves. So for instance, you can take a study with uh, 300 subjects and uh, reduce the, the training set and see uh, what you gain. Uh, uh, so uh, using standard decoding, so uh, study specific decoding or the multi-study decoder in a range. So of course the, or in a range you do in general better uh, with the single study decoder, but you also see that the performance gap is reduced when you increase the number of samples. And once again, it's, it looks like uh, I think the multi-study thing provides a kind of prior that helps classifying on small studies when you have a small data set. It's like a Bayesian prior at the end, okay? But the uh, most beautiful part of this thing is that uh, we can now look at the 128 uh, intermediate networks, which are uh, so brain networks uh, extracted from the data and that can be associated with the terms that they help uh, to decode. So each network has a topography because it was derived by, uh, by, uh, from the set of images from the regions that you had originally and it can be used to decode some, some concepts. And um, as the reviewer said, but we already knew that. We already knew that there is a, a phase response in the physical phase area, et cetera. But still, this is the first brain, functional brain atlas, which is actually data-driven. Because what people do usually is that they draw the FFA uh, uh, on the brain. Uh, and if you try to fit it to your individual subject, it never fits perfectly well. But here, this, uh, this pattern that you see on the image, they are actually used to decode uh, the function of these regions, okay? So this is great, and it's even greater because it's public. Uh, you can use it, uh, reuse it as much as you want. Okay, it was great, but uh, still we were uh, just at the image level of analysis. We just leveraged uh, uh, good uh, classifiers that capture, that leverage the image structure. Let's go a bit further and try to capture common concepts across studies. And so the name of the game is that you, you give me any brain image and I should be able to, to guess, what, to, to, to figure out what was, uh, would be the cognitive condition associated with this image. And of course, it's funny only if you provide me an image from the study that I've never seen before. Um, it's more tricky now because it's not a multi-class problem, it's a multi-label problem because there could be multiple labels that would fit an image. It could be a tone counting task, which would involve uh, uh, sound perception and counting. So you have some labels potentially associated with the images and you don't even know how many. So we did that uh, now almost 10 years ago already uh, by using a relatively small uh, data set that we had uh, annotated uh, manually as we could at the time. And uh, we already could get, so we could decode 20 terms 
quite better than with state-of-the-art techniques. So we use the so-called ontology decoder that was tr trying to, to uh, have a, a common definition of the concepts. Uh, and we see that it outperformed uh, some baselines for this kind of task. For instance, Neurosynth is a tool people would use typically to, to do this kind of task uh, that is publicly available. Uh, and once again, it was we had some uh, uh, brain regions uh, corresponding to this decoding task. Uh, let me skip that. Um, so we've pushed it a bit further uh, recently by taking all the data that are provided by people uh, in the NeuroVault database. So uh, when people publish a paper, we often invite them to uh, uh, publish the contrast images, the statistical images, uh, in a public repository together with annotations describing the task that was performed by the participant. The problem is that when people provide the, the labels, the tags, actually it's uncurated, okay? So you get anything. Um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, well, some images are not even uh, uh, human brain images, so you need to, to, to of course, to, to uh, filter a little bit. But then you need to guess that LHVSRH means left hand versus right hand, and it means that the subject was performing a, a, a motor task with the left hand. So it's kind of guess game. But still, from that, we can get 48,000 usable images, which is not bad and coming from a large collection of studies. Now, in terms of annotations, we started to, to rely on a, a standard atlas, cognitive atlas, which is the base, best resource we have at the moment to, uh, with, about, uh, with a few hundred terms de describing uh, the most standard cognitive conditions. So, uh, how it works. Um, you take the NeuroVault images, we will first, uh, uh, um, sorry, we'll so select the ones that are usable. We will standardize them as much as possible to make them a bit more homogeneous and code them in our 1000 dimensional dictionary that I presented previously. And then we have essentially a 1000 dimensional vector for each image. We are ready to decode. What do we decode? Well, we, we, we take the annotations available from uh, uh, NeuroVault then we try to map them to the cognitive atlas uh, terms, which provide some concepts. Then we enrich them. I will describe this later. And then, so we have some uh, terms associated and we try to decode these terms from the data. Um, it works. So now we can uh, decode 37 terms from the uh, associated with these images, which were provided by the, by the community. So this is an IUC level, so 0.5 is chance. So a few of them are not decoding uh, super well. Actually, this is the frequency of the term on the, on the left side. And you can see that the, the very frequent terms are actually uh, hard to decode. Maybe they are not used in a very uh, consistent manner or not very informative about what was actually happening. And so we cannot uh, get them easily like working memory. I think for instance, it's hard to, to decode. But anyway, uh, we, we are doing well on many terms and we are actually doing uh, uh, better than, for instance, previous uh, baseline doing these kind of things. Okay, uh, but realized, we realized by doing that that the main issue was from the uh, labeling. Um, uh, because when people label images, they label their intentions, what they wanted to probe uh, and uh, with, there will be lots of false negatives. They will uh, forget some obvious things. Uh, and so we, we try to uh, fill in the holes by uh, just by relying on the ontology structure of cognitive atlas. For instance, we know that speech perception would involve some kind of uh, audio, sorry, I don't see well, but uh, uh, sound perception uh, for sure. And it's also involved, it's also a language task. So for instance, when there is speech uh, understanding, then we can certainly also associate a language tag uh, with this image. And so when we do that, we are actually, you can actually decode uh, more terms and with more accuracy on the test data set. Uh, now we can decode a bit more than uh, 50 terms, okay? Uh, and still uh, better than uh, previous baselines. 
So um, that's great. Uh, there is signal in this data and we can uh, leverage it. Um, so we, we also provide the, the um, uh, special patterns that are used to decode each of the terms that we could probe. Uh, when we open the box and we try to see what's happening, some cases are super easy, like uh, the motor regions are very easy to, to identify and we get actually 98% accuracy. That's uh, really uh, easy. Um, then, um, interestingly, for instance, when we look at the uh, decoding uh, map, for instance, for the term is, is for syntax. So when we have a condition in language processing that is specifically targeting syntax, we can look at the encoding map, which would be just a correlate of doing syntax processing, or the decoding maps. What in the brain tells you that the subject is doing a syntax task and nothing else? Well, it's a bit different. With the decoding task, we'll have more anterior regions in the STS, and then more of Broca's area uh, to decode this term, which, is, which seems to be more consistent with the literature. So this tells us that decoding is a good thing to do. And there are some failures. Um, if you try to do uh, face perception, well, uh, of course you will find the FFA uh, involved. Okay, great. But if you do face recognition, well, you just find the FFA again, plus maybe a little bit of the uh, uh, left motor cortex because people press the button with the right hand when they, when they recognize the face. So we have captured nothing but just uh, face perception and button press. Uh, even worse, uh, emotion perception, we find again the FFA. And uh, well, you would have expected the amygdala or something like that. But it turned out that when people want to probe face, they, they use typically the Harari uh, task based on faces. And so we have these huge biases that in emotions are studied through the lens of face perception. And so we have a, a, a big confounder here. Okay, so it's, it's still not working. It's, uh, it just outlines the limit of this publicly uh, valuable data. Okay, so what we learned by doing that is that um, much of the difficulty is not uh, that much in, um, in the uh, image quality or image signal to noise ratio or even image correspondence across studies or individuals. I think the big issue is to annotate correctly the images because people are not trained for that. They are not used to thinking of uh, how can I make my data well reusable by using proper annotations. So, uh, we, and we don't have any good uh, cognitive ontology that would tell us how to organize cognitive processes. We, that, no, such, no, sorry, no such thing exists at the moment. Um, so what do we do? What we can do is just to learn uh, statistically uh, uh, what terms should be used and how to map them. So uh, that's what we started to do by uh, studying the, the literature. And there is lots of information that is contained just in text. Okay, there is about 100,000 neuroscience publications that can be used to learn, for instance, the co-occurrence of terms and their associations among them and with um, anatomical entities in the brain or special locations in the brain. Such a sentence delivers a lot of information about cognition and the brain. So we need to, um, to get that by, uh, again, uh, uh, trying to get as much data as possible. Um, so we could get 40,000 um, uh, publications uh, on human uh, cognitive neuroscience that contain uh, uh, cognitive terms and special locations in MNI space. So provide, uh, described as triplets of uh, coordinates in the brain. Okay. so. Once you take one of the 14,000 publications, you have a text which provides you uh, the semantics of, the, of what is studied and the, this table of coordinates that provides you location. So take the text and just do some uh, transform. So we did not do much fancy things so far. We have done a TFIDF just to represent a bag of word a model to represent the information contained in the text. I, I'm sure that we can do uh, uh, much better now using uh, uh, 
modern language models. And by the way, I have a postdoc position open to, to do that if somebody is interested. And uh, we also take the, the brain locations. We, we put a Gaussian kernel on each uh, location. And this uh, generates a kind of brain map that tells you uh, well, what is the brain maps associated with this paper. And then given the uh, text representation and the brain map, you want to learn the mapping. And here by stupid uh, ridge regression. Um, but it doesn't work because you know you've got this one variety of distribution where certain terms will be uh, uh, used very frequently and most of them very rarely. So what we introduced was a semantic smoothing, which means that when you have a, a rare terms, you don't want to map it directly. You want to look at, oh, what are the terms that co-occur with it? And can I map those? So if you take melody, um, melody would be associated with, I get uh, music, speech, auditory. And these are terms that you can uh, map well uh, to the brain. Okay, So we will bias the uh, query to say, OK, you wanted to, uh, to learn about melody. Well, we don't know much about melody, but we can uh, tell you about auditory music and pitch. And by combining these maps, we get that one. And by doing some causalization work, we show that it's actually better. You reduce the variance of the estimator much more uh, than you bias it. And so you actually you win in terms of accuracy by doing this semantic smoothing or semantic biasing of the query. And for instance, <clears throat> with standard uh, systems like Neurosynth, if you take different terms related to mental arithmetics, uh, you would have uh, different maps depending on uh, the frequency of the terms in the literature. While with our tool NeuroQuery, we essentially bias these queries to, to the kind of the same set of core terms. And at the end, we get a very similar pattern. Okay. And so this is a, an interface that you can use, neuroquery.org. Uh, you can paste any free text uh, in English, uh, uh, if possible, with cognitive uh, meaning. And it will uh, then expand your query into terms that it can map and then provide you uh, an answer uh, to that. Sometimes it fails, of course, uh, because well, the literature is imperfect and the mapping from terms to, to the brain is still uh, brittle. Um, with this, I'm going to, to conclude. So uh, essentially the philosophy of this presentation was to show that uh, uh, the big data approaches now can be used for, for brain mapping and we should use them because we want our results to be generalizable across labs, across uh, uh, traditions in the field. And this means extracting a weak signals from huge amounts of data. And to some extent, it also means that we, we accept to, uh, to lose a bit of the, of the subtlety of each individual experiment to make them comparable across studies. Okay? When I present that to my colleagues, they are often a bit disappointed because they feel that we, we lost all, the, all the, the essence of the research because we, 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 uh, we make it to course somehow by, by mapping it to uh, standard terms. But this is a path that the community needs to go, maybe before going back to more, more subtlety, more, more complexity. But at least for the moment, we still need to uh, agree on the model of the brain and how uh, uh, the main cognitive functions are mapped to the brain. And so far, it's not the case. Okay, what, what we have, we have no resource, no functional atlas. We just have the literature, and we have to deal with that. Okay, so let's accept to simplify a little bit and try to, uh, to create at least broad categories in which, uh, which we can map accurately uh, with an accuracy that we can measure uh, to the brain. So the, the difficulty is, is us to build uh, common representations across data sets. So this is a, a hard task. Um, but the, the nice message is that, uh, well, there's already a lot of value in the data shared by the community. So resources like Open Neuro, NeuroVault, and Cognitive Atlas are great. They are an excellent uh, basis to, to rebuild uh, cognitive neuroscience. Uh, and so we are still improving that. For instance, at the moment, we are trying to show that 
we can uh, instantiate decoders based on the literature and show that it generalizes to uh, neurovolt uh, decoding. Uh, just one word on software. Uh, uh, all this has to, to be usable by, pe by people at the end. So what we have done was to develop a Python ecosystem uh, based on scikit-learn that we started some time ago. Uh, but then with tools like Nylon and m &E, we want to build a, um, a system of tools that people can, can leverage easily uh, and be empowered to, to uh, access more easily to the data, perform all these decoding tasks so that we can share them uh, more and more easily. And with this, I would like to, to thank all my colleagues and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, very exciting. Um, so we are uh, we have time for a few questions. I'll carry. You. Take a quick one. Okay. Uh, very quickly. Thank you so much for this uh, beautiful talk. Um, I had a question regarding multi multimodalities. So this is mainly fMRI. Um, including data like EEG and MEG, and potentially the idea of learning transfer functions where if we have way more fMRI databases, for some tasks, we have a lot of MEG data or EEG data in the literature. Uh, maybe we can learn some relationships between the two, and then we could also then predict, for example, MEG responses from fMRI. Have you, is this something that you've played around with? And uh, what are your thoughts on this? No, not yet. Uh, it's a great suggestion. And um, <clears throat> so we need to find a common ground essentially to, to, to be able to leverage these modalities. You know, we've been talking about EEG in, a, in fMRI for 20 years, and we all know that experimentally, it's super hard to do it simultaneously. So maybe at the, at the uh, uh, cross studies level, we can do something. The, the, to me, the big question uh, that I would send to you would be, um, how do we build, um, what are the signature that we think from the EEG and MEG data. So how do we represent the, the say the burst of activity that are meaningful to, to uh, characterize the cognitive processes that we can then uh, uh, make a say an atlas, a dictionary of these things, and then we can start uh, putting all that together. I I'm super excited. I saw that there was a lightning, co lightning talk on a work that does multimodality with uh, encoding, decoding. It's, it's so great to see that, yeah. Yeah, I think it was the first poster, so uh, that yeah. Was, yeah, the first lightning talk today, so you could check out the poster later on. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. So hello, thanks for the great talk. Uh, from what I understand, the results you are showing are mostly uh, atlases uh, for decoding kind of like at the level of group of subjects that have been projected in, a, in some kind of like a standardized space, right? So I know you're also involved in more initiative trying to do that at the individual level. So do you think we can generate this type of like really rich brain decoder that can pull many different type of cognitive functions for that would work for individual subjects? Or like, can we do mind reading basically? <laughs> um, I think we need both, okay? Uh, um, uh, so. As you know, Pierre, uh, I, I'm, I've also worked on the collection of, of data on uh, doing deep phenotyping on uh, 12 participants that we have scanned 50 times, doing as many protocols as possible. And indeed, the idea would be to uh, uh, say, okay, uh, we, we can have a functional atlas at the population level, but then we should also be able to, to warp it to uh, individual data. Uh, and we're getting closer and closer uh, to that. And that, that's great. Uh, but still, I think uh, for people who, who have, you know, are uh, asking their own cognitive questions, I think it's important to have a kind of population level normative model uh, that will be um, that will uh, characterize uh, uh, territories and function. I think that maybe I, I was a bit quick on that, but uh, what matters here. Is that uh, okay? You, you have these uh, regions which are well outlined, um, but I think that in some cases the the word cloud that goes together with the regions is quite important. 
knowing that a region is important to, to, to infer that a cognitive process was done. And you, for that, for instance, you need to look at the, I don't know, the, the insula, uh, the entire insula. Uh, and this uh, gives you hints about what function was done at that time is, uh, is very important. And we are still missing this kind of knowledge. So the, the co-occurrence of different functions in, in some, uh, say, functional hubs uh, is essentially to, to move forward uh, in our understanding of the brain of, of consciousness, who we are discussing the TPJ uh, this morning, uh, and essentially relying on this kind of inference that, uh, oh, this, this thing is involved in a conjunction of functions, and from that we will understand better the, the brain. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Bertrand, for the talk. That was super. Uh, I was thinking of the, the problem that we seem to have is a lot of uh, basically standards and normalization of the way we describe and, and, and also the way we, we share the data, right? I mean, like, uh, at the moment, we're extracting XYZ from the literature, which is crazy. Uh, we are getting you know, neural vault uh, maps that are you know, pretty bad, which is also crazy. And there's no... Uh, so I was thinking, do you have any idea of some kind of incentive that people would say, oh, okay, I'm going to use that tool that will give me back something such that, and in the process, we normalize both the vocabulary and possibly the data sharing aspects of those maps. Uh, a little bit like what Open Neural was supposed to do in some ways. It was supposed to be say, hey, send me your bits data and we'll get you uh, the uh, pre-processed data. You know, they kind of abandoned that for because you know, practical reasons, but you know, are there uh, good ideas to have on the side of uh, uh, tools that will help the community to normalize and, and adopt you know, standard ways of describing both like, you know, the uh, uh, vocabulary and, 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 and the data side of things? Yeah, you make me think that so uh, I, I, maybe I, I failed to mention two things. One is indeed BIDS, which is a common format for uh, uh, organizing uh, brain imaging data. Uh, it's, it has an uh, incredible role in structuring uh, the work of the community. Uh, second one is that BIDS, Open Neuro, NeuroVault, Cognitive Atlas, all come from the same lab, Poldrak Lab in Stanford. With, with, of course, with the help of the community, and that this is great that people have worked together on it. Uh, but uh, it's important to give credit to the people who have uh, who have uh, launched all these efforts. Um, so, um, yeah, I think I can only agree uh, with your suggestion. Uh, I think that if you want to uh, uh, people to do it more systematically, we should give them something back. So, uh, uh, for instance, if when people uh, provide the images, uh, like in a neural vault style uh, interface, we can say, oh, maybe this was, um, um, I don't know, uh, uh, working memory, for instance, uh, involved here, or maybe a very complex task or something like that. And then uh, first, it would help the, the, the user to uh, select some potential keywords that would uh, fit well the data. So maybe avoiding too many false negatives, et cetera, in the, in the labeling. Uh, and it will also be fun for people essentially see, oh, how is my uh, experience uh, uh, characterized by the, by the system? I think that would be great. So we need to think more of, you know, uh, kind of something where people are, are a good incentive to, to share their data. No more questions? Okay, so I think we can move to the next slide. Thank you so much. Yes.